I think we are all deeply concerned over the problems of the day, but perhaps we should take some consolation in the realization that we are here for the purpose of learning and growing and not merely to have a good time. If it was a good time basis, it's been a dismal failure <laughs> from the, almost the most ancient periods of history. There's been nothing around but trouble. But trouble it can be and is part of a great system of education. The average school child does not enjoy going to class and will find every possible way of avoiding it. The same way the adult person does not wish to be burdened with responsibilities and problems. He has finally become accustomed to accepting some of them. But whenever the condi condition or situation gets a little too complicated, his first thought is to move out from under it and let somebody else worry. Now we have also a set a very bad example. Some people say that history doesn't mean anything and that we don't need to look back upon the past to find out what lies ahead. But in actual fact, history is tremendously important if we really dig into it and find out what it can mean to us now. History tells us the whole story. It tells us why we are what we are and how we got here and what is the matter with what we are doing now. This is all clearly set forth because all this has happened many times. We are not the only civilization that has been in trouble. In fact, we cannot find one that has not been in trouble. And the troubles nearly always result from individuals breaking the simple rules of right living. As long as we break these relentlessly, we are going to be in this kind of difficulty. If we keep on breaking them long enough, our difficulties will increase and will become fight perhaps in the end unbearable. We don't know, we hope not. Now the problem of today is that the individual has always depended upon certain supports to make it possible to live a good life in a confused world. These supports have been idealism, the realization that there is a good reason for things, and that there are hopes if we will deserve them. Idealism has always been that part of wisdom which impels us to self-improvement and the recognition that good rewards are the consequences of right conduct. The second problem that involves us today is atheism. Atheism is a very serious phase of materialism. On the level of industry, politics, and sociology, we are more or less uh, materialists. On the cultural side of life and the religious side, there has been a great wave of atheism which has contributed to the present misery. If we live in this world from the cradle to the grave with nothing to hope for except perhaps a little advance in salary and we know perfectly well that in due time we shall depart as all others have, if this becomes the basis of a way of life, we are very nearly bankrupt. Also, if in this philosophy of life that we have, we ignore the religious factor, if we are content to deny a divine principle at the source of life, if we are inclined to look upon ourselves as shipwrecked humanities on an island in space with no hope and nothing to dream about, if we take this attitude, we are also defeated. De defeated because we have nothing to live for if we have no reasonable code to live by. So we are very largely under the domination 
of a very stark materialism. This materialism has become the secret of the power or the way of survival. We live now only for material success. It is the only hope that we have is wealth or fame or some type of materialistic advantage. We try to gain promotion. We work for public office. We seek to be an executive. All for what? All as a way of filling in the interval between the cradle and the grave. This particular type of career that we now consider to be all-sufficient and the perfect evidence of progress is simply a dead end. There is nothing in it to inspire the person to do anything except try to get enough money to live comfortably or luxuriously. If he lives comfortably, he is dissatisfied. And if he lives luxuriously, he is self-destructive. There seems to be no way of getting away from the very simple fact that the individual without some vision of future, some purpose above the monotony of materialism, unless we can supply the individual with higher incentives, we're going to continue the way we are. The great sweep of atheism that has swept the world has come very largely from science. It was not originally a political problem. It was true, there were atheists. There have always been atheists. But atheism was a philosophy, not a world power. Today this philosophy of nihilism, so to say, has become a major fact in the lives of hundreds of millions of human beings. This particular atheism destroys the inducement or the incentive for ethics, it completely wrecks morality and destroys the individual's ability to transcend present conditions because of hope for better things to come. To take away from the individual something that is a strength to him, something that induces right action, that supports integrity and ethics, take these things away as meaningless and useless and insist that the individual will go down to sleep forever and no one will ever care what he does or what he has done. This is gradually undermining human civilization. It is destroying any purposeful reason for progress. Now we talk of nothing but progress. But to us, progress is nothing more or less than bigger and better computers. Progress is nothing but the advancement of the materialistic activities in which we are now engaged. And even among us, there is this very definite suspicion that this kind of progress is slowly fading away. That the progress which results in nothing but physical economic complication is not an answer to the human need. We can make bigger and bigger computers, but if we have smaller and smaller people to run them, we will gradually come to the point where we will expect the computer to think for us. And this is going to be a disaster, because there is no real way in which any individual can escape the responsibility of doing his own thinking. Now, we look at the human being to see what his potentials are. Here he is upon this desert island, surrounded by pressures, surrounded by competition and dishonesties, all kinds of unreasonable and irrational policies. And we say, what is he going to do about it? How is he going to live better in the world as he finds it? Well, from a very ancient time, human beings have contemplated this issue and have all come to a general agreement, namely that growth is an individual process. There is nothing that can prevent an individual from improving if he wants to. The question is, what will he pay for it? How will he so live that he will improve rather than merely increase the mass of public debt? 
To improve, the individual has to personally take over his own destiny. He has to do that which in his own heart and conscience he knows is right. And if he has no heart and conscience uh, reply at the moment, he must find it. It is absolutely necessary that every individual become an idealist. It is necessary that he shall believe in the Ten Commandments. It is necessary that he shall have a belief in the immortality of his own soul and the victory of wisdom and love over ignorance and hate in this world. It is absolutely necessary that the individual ceases to be a materialist. Of course, the uh, process of ceasing to be a materialist may seem a rather important decision to make. It may interfere with wealth, fame, position, public office, and these various procedures that we now consider so important. I think the answer is definitely that while we believe the unreal to be important, we're going to stay as we are. As we are willing, however, to recognize that there is a reality that is more important than, than wealth and fame. There is a destiny higher than that of the laboratory technician. When we begin to realize this, we get hold of some of these loose ends and do something about it. So uh, today we are looking for some foundations upon which we can build a survival technique, something that we can depend upon. Now, when we begin this, we have to take a passing look at exper experience. We have to figure a little bit what's happening around us. We have to see about it. At the moment, we're having a very pro bad problem on narcotics. We are having people making fortunes by distributing destruction, distress, and death. We have millions of people who have been well informed and are constantly being battered with proof of the fallacy of narcotics who continue to go on and take them simply because they get a high for a little while and then a low forever. This is something uh, that we see around us. Why, why is it necessary to make rules that people shall be decent in traffic and regulations? Why is it necessary that we should have to build laws against terrorism in its various forms? What has happened? Why do these things suddenly become tremendous factors in daily life? Well, the answer seems to def definitely be that a pattern has taken over, which many people believe in, but which is not true. It has invaded education, and some of the worst examples of narcotics will be found in the universities and in the high schools and down into the uh, junior grades. It is interfere it is interfered with our sports, which we used to consider to be a very healthy way of expressing natural energies. It is becoming a tremendous financial factor, making it possible for crime to buy practically everything it wants. And the average individual either is not addicted and therefore reads only as a viewer or is already addicted and may or may not be willing to quit. With this situation, something's wrong behind the scene. It's not the narcotics that we have to look at. It is not the terrorism that is the basis of our great need. It is to understand the forces and circumstances that make such conditions possible in the modern world. It is a simple statement of fact. Instead of being a progressive people, we are retrograding into savagery and barbarism. And what we call progress is nothing but mechanistic technicality. It is bringing us nothing. It is not making us a good home maker. It is not guarding our children. It is not advancing our education. It has gradually reduced us to almost, we might say, to a new kind of slavery. Not the slavery of the ancients that we have fought so hard to overcome. Not the slavery that Abraham Lincoln's sought to correct in relationship with the Negro situation. 
but, the, but slavery to a possessing idea, slavery to a way of life which exists primarily to assemble fortunes for a few and leave the rest completely incapable of living understanding and intelligent lives because they have no training in it. If we want to give the world a real step forward, we've got to use the institutions that we possess, reorient them, set them in proper motion, and have them supply us with what we need. What we need is hope, what we need is faith, and what we need is a general understanding of love in our relationships with life, with people, and the world in which we live. All these factors are being completely ignored. And that is, as far as the advanced echelons are concerned. The individual who is still honest is regarded with a certain amount of pity. It is also doubted that he has a sound mentality. If he is happy, actually, he is probably captured in some kind of a mania that gives him a nervous exhaustion without any intellectual or emotional progress. All these things are problems we have to face. So unless we're willing to face them, it's going to drift along and each generation and each civilization will finally come to the dust as it always has in the past. We have to either take hold of situations, do something about them, and get over the absolute tyranny of wealth and power and find out what makes the individual a proper human being. Among other noticeables, it is obvious that the present procedure, which is now generally approved, is causing more ill health than most people can afford. And the effort to regain that health is far more expensive than anyone can afford. We are simply paying a tremendous price for determining to live badly. And we will have to continue in this also. But there is a simple way of getting a different look at this. And unless we get a different look, we're going to be in trouble all the way along. Back in the 16th century and early 17th century, it was decided that there was a great need for house cleaning in the field of education. Up to that time, in Europe particularly, the educational facilities had been inadequate. In the 16th, 15th, 14th century, uh, Europe was probably one of the poorest countries in the world as far as education is concerned. There was no pattern for any definite system to help young people grow. They had to depend upon their elders, and most of the elders were uninformed and many were illiterate. So this problem brought to attention the need for a different schooling system, something to give children an education so they could get on their feet, so that they could correct the mistakes of some of the previous generations and build a better world in the course of years than the one they came into. In this particular situation, it was res resolved by the first educators of the modern world that primarily education had to be a structure built upon the foundation of ethics and dedicated to the proving of ethics. It had to be something that made ideals more important. In education today, the great need is still for ideals. The educational system which carries the average person through the high school is deficient, every educator knows it, and now some efforts are being made to correct at least part of it. Instead of young people going to school to learn, they go to school to form gangs and cliques and get on narcotics at a tender age. This type of thing is partly due to the fact that the whole system of the raising of young people is wrong. It is false, and it is simply a byproduct of the selfishness of adults, and also, of course, the lack of vision of the social structure. So if the school started in by simply pointing out the beginning of a good career was ethics, 
and prove conclusively that the real reason for science is not to put ships in space. The real reason for science is to help every individual to understand himself and through the understanding of himself to build a better life because science proves that this understanding is true. The real reason and purpose for science is that it shall build a solid foundation under the hopes of the race and not settle back to problems of competitive uh, exploitation. The reason for science is that it shall show us how to live. And to show us how to live does not require years and lives of vast research. Because when the vast research is all finished, man is still born, man is suffers, and man dies. Therefore, the purpose of a living science is to come in and help to build a foundation under dreams, to make it obvious and provable, as they could if they wanted to, that there are rules in life, perfectly scientific, that if kept, will bring the human being into a security he has never known, and if broken, will leave him where he is. So science has to become ideal. Education has to idealize. It has to put values above wealth. It has to put integrities above so-called success. And it must teach the young people that they are not born to do exactly as they please. They are born to do as they should. There are rules governing life. If those rules are broken long enough, we can't build enough penitentiaries. If we get this thought a little clearer in our minds, then we can hit into another aspect of the situation. Labor. Work is work no matter how you figure it. But work is also very useful. Work is the only value that most people can actually develop. It is the only thing the individual has to do whether he likes to or not. Work is a routine, a regimentation, yes but it is a regular use of energy. The individual has this much discipline that he has a job and he wants to keep it. Now this discipline is variously adulterated by the corruptions that exist throughout the world of employment. But the fact remains that employment is necessary. It's the only way we have of keeping millions of people from spending the entire day at the television. <laughs> if they have to go off to work, at least there is a little interlude of something else. <laughs> the, the entire problem of work, then, is discipline. It is built upon one of the first laws of nature. If you don't work, you can't eat. Now, this is pretty obvious. And even with the wonderful generosity of governments, there is something to be said for the fact that just plain human dignity requires labor. That we have to do things to earn things to have things. If we get them other ways, otherwise we are dishonest. So labor has to get into the realization that there is a reason for work. And as I've noticed in many occasions among the Japanese people, this seems to be more or less evident. I remember way back in the 20s, when I was in Japan, that uh, the uh, uh, Nippon Ginko, the great Japanese bank, was a very precious and very important economic institution. How it was run in the background, I have no idea, but it had a long and successful reputation among po persons of the best integrities. But the primary purpose in the Nihon Ginko was to employ as many persons as possible on a job. In other words, if you had ten cousins, they should all work. And if you were in a position to employ them or see that they were employed, you should help to do it. No one should receive help who doesn't work. And in the case I mentioned, it was done by passing a check through about ten hands before it was cashed and each one putting his seal on it. 
this was a way of keeping people eating. And uh, this keeping them eating was not a government subsidy. It was that those who have powerful institutions made sure that as many as possible got work in their institutions. The present motion is exactly the opposite here. The problem is forever to have fewer people and turn to machines or is now most common. In most business organizations, it is the customer who takes care of himself and the management takes the profit. We do not even serve people anymore in many forms of business. They have to take care of themselves. They have to put the gas in the car themselves. They have to stand in line for the groceries themselves. Everything is going back to the individual because it is cheaper. This type of thing is a low ethical level that we have to do a great deal of thinking about because these things all add up to something. It is contrary to our doctrines and beliefs here to bring politics into the picture. But I think we can all realize that the political situation is involved in the same problems. It has its own internal difficulties, and it is working upon a public that does not know what to cooperate with and what not to cooperate with. So everything goes along on a level of ignorance, uncertainty, confusion, discord, and conflict. All these factors assail another level of life. The home is another institution that is suffering keenly from the attitudes of the time. Gradually, the home, which was the foundation of civilization, is becoming merely a kind of boarding house. It is no longer a significant place where a family unit works together for a common good. It is no longer a unit that is supported by happiness, that is happy to do the things that it is doing. It is now doing what it has to do in order to survive. And survival now means, for the average person, a high level of luxury. Then we go into the religious field. I think one of the old Kabbalists made a very famous remark like than this count. He said, there are 70 names of God, but only one God. Now, this is a very great thought-provoking statement. Here we have a world of religion, which has been locked in discord since the beginning of history. It is a mass of believers, all with almost identical beliefs, but doing everything they can possibly do to prevent working together. This is one of the great problems. Religion is failing the individual. And those that are in the lower brackets of education are particularly affected because religion to the poverty-stricken was the elixir of life. It was the one great hope. It was beauty in sordidness. It was wonder in pain. And it was survival because of the strength of inner conviction. This is also being taken away, little by little. The simple fact of religious unity that would save the world hundreds of billions of dollars every year is still impossible or remote of probability. We are still divided in worship, and in this division we come upon another situation. It is a matter in which all religions about ours are less than ours, and therefore that there is no appreciation or working with a deep understanding of the spiritual unities of life. One of the great proofs we should have of religion is that we work together and that all religions rejoice in the works of each other and do not spend most of their time trying to run down their competitors. All the religious situation is poor. Then we go into health health situation is also very inadequate. Health is becoming more expensive every day and less certain. And with all the excitement and the, that has gone on here in the last hundred years particularly, the statistics prove that about all we have been able to actually accomplish is to 
provide the probability that the average person will live a year or two years longer than he would if it had not been for science. This particular achievement, however, is costing incredible sums of money with no certainty of success. Health is not attained because the average person doesn't want it. He wants what he wants. If he wants to eat himself into an early grave, he considers it's his right and privilege. Instead of following the classical concept that, it, that right is the basis of all values, the individual places his own appetite as the main criterion in the problems of living. Now we can go on with this for almost in infinity, but the points involved are simple and not too difficult. One sum, it all sums up in one basic uh, statement, namely that we cannot depend upon the world around us to get us out of this mess. The only way we're going to get out of it is to understand more of the world within us. It is the world that is invisible to sight. It is the world of those eternal powers and lights and lives with which nature has given us examples. We are individuals given a mind, given faculties, given opportunities, given privileges, and having received a beautiful garden to live in, which we are gradually and inevitably desecrating. We are the source of the whole thing. Now, someone will absolutely, no, no doubt, bring up the question, this, how can one person stand against this? How can one person live well in a world in the present state of affairs? Well, it's not as difficult as we are inclined to think. In the first place, the average individual is not as important to other people as he thinks he is. What he does is not as mindful to them as long as he doesn't annoy them. Therefore, if he wishes to live a little better, the majority of humanity will not even notice it. He can have his own code of life, at least in the Western world, with a reasonable probability of being able to live it without unreasonable complications. It is not necessary for the individual to conceal his integrities. What is necessary for him to do is to, con to develop them so that they are functioning in his own life. There is no earthly reason why any individual has to become a drug uh, addict simply because there are 50 million of them floating around the country. He does not have to follow the poorest and the weakest if he must have a peer group. He does not need to do any of these things with which uh, his life has been burdened. All these problems, it does not become necessary for him to be an activist or a terrorist. It is not necessary for him to be the richest man on the planet. All of these different excesses, whatever they are, are matters of personal choice. And in every case, a bad choice ends in an unhappy life. The individual has to finally cope with something that no scientist seems to be able to discover, and that is the source of the small, still voice inside of himself. The individual has conscience. The individual has within himself a realization may be faint, but it's there, of values, a realization that he is a person capable of a life, capable of having important contributions to make to society. He is a person who has a limited but inevitable individual sphere of influence. He is perfectly possible for the man to be a good father. And it is perfectly possible for the woman to be a good mother. The only problem is, in all these things, the temptations to uh, escape responsibility in the fulfillment of pleasant purposes, so-called. And yet these pleasant purposes all fall apart if they are not genuine and right. All around us are people getting themselves into trouble every day trying to be happy. 
there are also others that are in trouble already every day and are trying to get out of it. All this comes up to a very funny style of affair in which the world slowly looks more and more like a lunatic asylum, in which ordinary common sense, honesty, judgment, and integrity simply disappear. They fade out in favor of things that are of no value whatever. Most of the ancients have left us with a very con conscious thought that the claim or proclaim is of very little value. The individual can claim anything he wants to claim, but his conduct and his life are affected only by what he does. The individual may claim anything, and this is one of the problems that afflicts religion. Over a long period of time, it has become obvious to me that most religious people believe in God. Most religious people have a, an ability to quote scripture. They are also well-meaning, good-natured people. But they have not cultivated the inner spirit of a faith. They haven't even gotten far enough into the real meaning of religion uh, to stop criticizing their neighbors. They haven't gotten far enough to forgive a friend or a relative for some real or imaginary injustice. They haven't gotten far enough to stop regretting the past and building toward the future. They have not forgot to gossip. They have not found and saw a solution for what they call righteous indignation, of which there is no such thing. All of these problems show that somewhere religion has become words but not works. And the same has been true of law, the codes of countries, the declarations of independence, the Magna Carta, the Justinian Code. These have been codes which have been generally accepted. But there is hardly one of these codes that has not been violated almost before the ink was dried. All of the good things of life are accepted as real, but it is assumed that somebody else is going to live them, not ourselves. We want to do what we want to do. And as one man said to me, so help me, I'm going to. This uh, is the problem of the moment. This is the thing we have tried to do something about. Our greatest resources are two. The trouble we're in is one of the resources of improvement. The other resource is the internal capacity to grow. There is a way by which any need that we recognize can be achieved in ourselves. There is within our powers to think straight. And while that thought may not be necessarily highly scientific, or highly economic, the thought can be and is sufficient to our need if we will use it. There is no reason why anyone in this world today should not know the difference between right and wrong. The difference between right and wrong, however, is modified by selfishness, cupidity, and even terrorism. We are not willing to live up to what we really believe and know to be right. And because of that, we are always in the trouble. Now, as we go into another year, decade of time in this world, we see more and more evidence that is frightening. Now, to be frightened, an individual must have something to fear. And he fears the wrong thing. Instead of fearing world wars and uh, nuclear fission, he should fear his own inability to conduct himself with proper consciousness in the daily events of living. The fear of the person to become terror, to become uncontrollable, uh, and to lead to panic has caused what we call terrorism in many instances and supported it in others. We simply are unable to be ourselves. Yet, if we believe any of the major religions and philosophies of the world that are worth believing, 
we will realize that the individual is always the master of his own destiny. Regardless of what he goes through, regardless of his uh, uh, responsibilities and all the things that hamper him, the individual is himself and can be his self. The trouble is he is himself now, but it isn't good enough. He's got to improve these relationships, build a more complete and fulfilling destiny for his own kind. Man is the highest species of life that we know. And that is, it is visible to our common understanding. And it should be doing better than it is. It should be capable of leading the person into the proper fields of activity. It should enable the individual to say, honestly, this is not what I would prefer to do, but this is what is best for me, and do it. We have all kinds of opportunities, and I think the main thing we have to do is to t take on something as though we were taking a cure for dupe addiction. The way we're living is more or less in a state of constant addiction addiction to things that are useless, worthless, and destructive. We think we're doing pretty well, and many people are doing better than we know, but unfortunately they are not given recognition because the opinion makers are not the ones that are doing the best work. The opinion makers are trying desperately to perpetuate chaos instead of finding a cure for it. And for this particular reason, we cannot expect to be appreciated for what we do. Then another problem is one of rewards. Let us imagine for a minute uh, that we do try to think it through and see what is best for all concerned. We can't help but saying to ourselves, if I'm li living better, will I be happier? Well, the chances are you will be, but this is not the primary condition. You are living better because you must, because there is no way of escaping it without tremendous loss in values to yourself and your world. It isn't whether it's more profitable, it is rather it is necessary to survival. And if there is no survival, all profit becomes a delusion. So I want to start with something that is more or less a religious and philosophical note. We want to live as best we can in this particular environment. I think we should therefore all have somewhere in our own natures certain decisions. Whether we can live up to them perfectly or not is not the point. We should each of us realize that we can improve, that we can grow that we can develop those virtues which make us better for ourselves and more useful and helpful to others. There is some way in which we can do better. And having decided that there is such a way, we can begin to consider how to achieve it, how to do better. Sometimes it's merely to sit down and think things through. Perhaps we were all brought up in a better code than we are practicing today. If so, then we have to remember that which was good. We have to remember the virtues of our ancestors instead of justifying ourselves by carefully remembering their vices. It is a matter of selecting as far as we can that which is the best part of our own inner life. Having put this as near as we can into some kind of a pattern, then what are we going to do to improve it? How are we going to learn and grow? One thing we have to realize is that in the world of work, leisure time is the time best suited for personal improvement. It is very difficult to do an odd day's work and at the same time fulfill all the impulses and ideals of the inner life. On the other hand, we have a large part of our lives to ourselves. We have hours in every day that we do not work. Most people have at least two days a week in which they are not regularly employed. Time that is leisure is the time that we can best use for the cultivation of our own internal lives. It is in leisure that we have time to think. 
and it is our desperate effort to escape thinking that has prevented some develop within our own nature up to now. We do not need to watch second grade te te television shows the moment we get out of a business situation. We can have leisure enough to think, and in this leisure we can cultivate some type of understanding or knowledge superior to what we have now. In leisure we can read good books. In leisure, leisure we can develop habits and talents and abilities that are latent within ourselves. In leisure we can come to understand our friends better. In leisure we have more opportunity to share in the lives of our children. We cannot afford at this time to simply use leisure as an escape from labor. This is something we can no longer afford to do. Leisure must be useful. It does not want it to be dour or melancholy or sad or gloomy, but it must be a little bit serious. It must be serious at the same time perpetuating a sense of humor without which all fails. We need, however, a certain amount of time to grow, and that time is for us leisure. There are two periods of growth beside leisure. One is childhood, when, however, we have not yet experienced the need of responsibilities. Then there is retirement in which we have left the heavy labor of life and wish to do nothing as long as possible. Or if not that, at least we are no longer strong enough in our thinking to want to work real hard. We want to forget the problems that have burdened us. We want to relax and rest. Well, rest is wonderful, but rest is also leisure. And no one can really rest doing nothing. To just sit and look at the ceiling is not real rest. <laughs> so most people have something they do when they're resting. But is it something that they really should be doing? Or is it simply wasting time? Is it wasting this thing that we have so much to be grateful for? This thing that gives us the opportunity to grow every minute to the very moment of decease. No matter how old we are, we can grow some way, do something that is of value, or contemplate our own lives in terms of estimating value and using our own career as a textbook which will help us to understand life. So that leisure is something we should very definitely never waste. Now relaxation is very good. We all need to relax. But leisure is relaxation if it is properly used. Leisure and relaxation are one thing, because if we try to use leisure for tension and get all worked up over something, it isn't leisure anymore. So we have several hours a day, maybe a number of days a year, and some years of life, in which we can contemplate the realities and values. We can make new assessments of the real reason for our own existence. We can begin to develop various overtones. Now we have, of course, two possible inducements for this. One is to grow and the other is to gain profit. Many people use leisure time to create new business organizations or to manufacture products or to become involved in some type of profitable occupation. Leisure time is therefore sometimes merely dedicated to economic improvement. Unless this is absolutely necessary to survival, I don't think it should be cultivated. Leisure is a time in which we can live with God and ourselves. Leisure is an opportunity to search for value. And if we are not impelled to search for value, then we must uh, develop that gift. Otherwise, we shall be part of that world w widespread of failures upon which we are so reluctant to give attention. Actually, therefore, leisure is a good thing, and it gives us a lot of opportunity. Nearly everyone has values. 
Now consider, for instance, that the human being has over 40 potential specializations of value within himself. There are at least 40 different possibilities for career, for growth, for improvement, for fulfillment, and for instruction. These 40 faculty powers will not all be developed in any particular embodiment, nor should they need to be. But uh, as uh, Dr. Lovata so well pointed out over uh, nearly 200 years ago, that it's a shame for an individual who has, who has 40 capacities to live and die with the use of only three or four or five. But this is what is happening. The, the technician on the computer uses three or four faculties and depends upon his home life for the rest. And because he is an expert on the computer, his home life may be pretty much neglected anyway. But it is not good for a person to have only one tremendous dedication, nearly always for profit, fame, or something of this nature. The leisure should be used as a cultural instrument. We are expected to divide the day into labor, leisure, and rest. We have, therefore, the leisure to meet with others, to think with them, to enjoy communion with good things, to study, to travel, to have all kinds of useful opportunities. But these all fail if there is no recognition of usefulness within the individual himself. If none of these things mean anything to him, and all that is important is a bottle of beer and the TV, he is not going to achieve very much. And his failure is a miniature of the world's failure. He is just a microcosm of the world condition. He is doing exactly what is causing the trouble for all humanity. He is suffering for them, and he is suffering also because he is like them. So this should require further emphasis. Out of leisure comes the possibility of a little, a little deeper approach to life. Leisure gives opportunity for the cultivation of art, of music, of literature, and of religion. Leisure gives the individual the opportunity to contemplate and meditate upon the great values of living. It enables him to become aware of the nobility of those who have gone before and the sacrifices they have made for the perpetuation of human culture. So all kinds of leisure kind of lift the individual up a little. They lift him up to a new sense of his own identity. He suddenly becomes aware that he can think, that he can learn, and that his life does not have to be a wheel in a squirrel cage, that he can have a personal existence, even though he lives in a world of monotonous uh, identification of work. Actually, therefore, the beginning of our whole problem is that the person should realize he can grow, realize he has the opportunity to grow, and develop the intensity which will make him make the most of the opportunity. It is perfectly possible for each person to become very much wiser and better than he believes he could be. The greatest wisdom in this world comes not out of formal schooling, but out of the careful consideration and thoughtfulness concerning the experiences of life and also an observation of the environment in which he lives. So with this type of thing, we also have other problems. We can go to Socrates, for instance, for a little consolation. When the time came for the Archons of Athens to uh, sentence Socrates to death, uh, his friends, disciples, and even Xantippe wept for him. But Socrates said, don't do it. Don't weep for me. Weep for the men who condemned, can, condemned me, because I'm leaving. But they're going to have to live with this for a few more years. Any individual, therefore, who does what is wrong or hurts or injures 
must live for a time with that which he injures, whereas the injured thing nearly always escapes. This is another interesting fact in the study of life's problems. So the person must kindly come to the conclusion that there are two paths that he can follow, one of which is fulfillment of appetite and desire, and the other is perfection of character. Religion finally leads the person to become a citizen in a larger universe, and this larger universe is here now. It is a mistake to assume that we are just one people dedicated to wealth and com competition. There is already a world of beauty right here. There is a world of friendship right here. And if we become a friend, we will have a friend. If we begin to live on a higher level of thinking or acting, we will discover that there are others on this level also. That it is not necessary to think that we are all alone in a wicked world. There are others like ourselves, and the moment we become like them, we recognize them. And the way to know the better is to know how to realize the better. And how to do that is simply to become better ourselves. So if we lift ourselves up, we will not land in a vacuum. We will land in the company of a considerable body of dedicated people who want to do the best they can to become good people and wise people and loving people who have overcome at least some of the physical limitations which have become the plague of our civilization. So the possibility of growing is not to move into isolation. It means to move into a higher stratum of the world's culture and find that there are there many who can help us and whom we can help. This is a part of life. Another point that we have to uh, take into consideration wherever there is a great misery there is a job wherever a world is in great trouble the thoughtful person must be trying to help no one can afford to stand by and do nothing while others suffer and while each person may have a different capacity to assist there must be something there must be at least a wonderful and cheerful and thoughtful prayer for those in trouble. There must be some expression of concern for that which has not achieved integrity. There must be something for those who are still struggling to meet the common problems of living. And it's only possible if those who try to help them have already attained some proficiency in this matter themselves. They may not have done everything that's necessary, but they're working in the right direction. So all along, uh, we have a, a kind of realization that I think is summarized in classical and even the better modern idealism, and that is that we live in a world that is basically and essentially spiritual. We live in a world in which a divine power is the dominant of all things. We therefore know that this divine power is good and that this divine power is not there to destroy us. It is not a constant punishing agent. The idea that we are here to suffer is not due to our cause or due to the power that created us. It is due to our own lack of willingness to accept the responsibilities of proper living. This universe is a magnificent, wonderful thing. And every one of us must ultimately become a graduate from the Universal Academy. We must all in the due course of time go through all the grades, finish the curriculum, and become graduates. We must all become, in a sense, the Phi Beta Kappas of the University of Hard Knocks, which is one of the biggest institutions in the world and one of the most valuable. So with this concept that we are not here to suffer, we're here to find out what causes suffering and correct it. We are not here to rebel against the infamies of our kind. We are here to grow strong enough and wise enough to help other people to also develop their internal potentials. And if the problem of suffering comes along, we are here if we are wise people to decide that it is better 
to suffer ourselves than to pass suffering on to others. That in every instance, the wiser the person is, the better he can control his own fortunes and misfortunes. He is no longer necessary for him to lean helplessly upon others no wiser than himself. As he looks through his assessment of values, he can find out where his courage lies, where his hopes are, where his faculties support him. And if he finds that these things are not good enough, then he must impose upon himself a self-designed curriculum. The young person who wants to graduate from the university has to go to school. And, and actually, our present life is the University of Hard Knocks in which we all have to graduate. And the universe has provided us this for one reason only, that until we achieve this within ourselves, our divine natures cannot be perfected. We cannot grow unless we become more aware of the meaning of life. And the meaning of life is growth and sharing and serving. And the great powers of life are to love, to think, and to serve. These are the things that we must all bear in mind and understand. Now, most people have read a book or two on the subject, and those who are, you know, thoughtful people have more or less this dedication already. In fact, there's very few people who have not read the New Testament or some part of scripture of some religion without, without realizing that they are in the presence of a doctrine of forgiveness, of love, and of fellowship. That we are actually, as the Sufi says, destined to be friends of God. We, God is our elder brother, our great friend, and our hope. God also is a being that has no need in itself. But the needs that it appears to have are the needs that we have for each other and which we assume to be of divine origin when the needs are nothing but the accumulation of the misfortunes with which we have plagued one another down through the ages. It is not deity that plagues or burdens or punishes. It is the deed itself which, if wrong, has to be corrected. Now, this is the only way in which the individual can be educated. Here we are with nearly five billion people, perhaps a few more, scattered over the continents of the earth. It is impossible for any system of knowledge that we know or any university to be large enough to educate them all. And it's even more difficult because of language, of race, of, of interests, locality, environment, heredity, all of these things have to be taken into consideration. So it is impossible to create a school great enough to teach everybody. And, of course, if one tried, there would be an immediate warfare and conflict and uh, a great turmoil with everyone mad at everyone else. Therefore, it can't be done that way. The way it is, instead of having one school uh, for all these people, we really, what we have is one need which each of these individuals must experience in himself. Each individual is in the same trouble. Therefore, whether he knows it or not, each individual must find his way out by the same path. There is only one path, and that is through self-discipline and dedication. There is no other way of working it out. It's the only way is the person himself enters the private university of his own memories, of his own thoughts, of his own beliefs, of his own environment. He sees the broken home. He sees the delinquent child. He wonders about his own mistakes. And out of all this, he p develops a curriculum. The only way in which the world can be educated is each person to take the responsibility for his own enlightenment. And if he does this, things get much better and life becomes much more endurable for himself and everyone else. If we want to start on a more or less, you know, simple basis, just look at your own life. Look it through back to the beginning. Many people looking through their lives have told me it wasn't so bad. They thought they got along pretty well. Others wish to forget it as quickly as possible. But the ones who want to forget it are the ones who should remember it because they are the ones who have unfinished business. 
There is an unfinished business as long as we cannot look upon life with quietude and peace. There is unfinished business if all we can remember is hurts. There is unfinished business if, as long as we hope to revenge ourselves for something, real or unreal. There is also something wrong if our sorrows are involved in things that are not important. If our lives have been destroyed by the law, by loss of money, we are in pretty sick condition. All of these things we have to weigh by going back and seeing just what we were and what we were doing. Going back as early as memory permits. We try to figure our relationship with parents, our relationships with brothers and sisters, and gradually as we grow older, the relationships with teachers and friends educators, and finally into marriage and our relationship with the spouse and children. All these things are pictures. And I am told many people say, in going over it, that if they could do it again, they would do it differently. Well, this is the most magnificent discovery they have made. But having decided if they do it again, they would do it differently, they overlook the fact that they are still doing it again, right then and there. Therefore, they can do it differently immediately, if they so desire. It is perfectly possible to benefit by past experience at almost any day of living. Most of all, people will begin to discover that a great deal of sorrow was unnecessary, that they regretted the things that were, should have been overlooked or mess, forgotten in the beginning. The sorrow over many things is unnecessary, and most of it is useless. We have to realize that sorrow is a human reaction, which we will keep. It will be there, but in also in every case it will be gradually made into a beautiful memory of some kind. It will be remembered for the truth, the beauty, the wisdom, the love in it, but the incident itself will fade out. Always along the way, therefore, we have the, this tremendous demand to change ourselves, to grow up, to make new use of the faculties that we possess. And we do it by using the, the textbook that has been given to us. The great alchemist, Raymond Lully, said that God had given man three textbooks upon which to base wisdom. The first is Holy Writ, the second is Nature, and the third is Himself. These are the three great books which each one of us must learn to read. It is not possible for us to read the Book of God directly. Therefore, we have to read it through scriptures. And these scriptures are the records of sanctified, thoughtful, and dedicated persons who have had the highest and most noble motives that we know of in humanity. The second, of course, is nature. That was how Lao Tse became a great philosopher, sitting by the side of a hill and looking out upon the beauties and wonders of the world. And he saw nature unfolding. We can do that today, but the moment we do this, we find out something that perhaps Lao Tse could only intuit. We find out that nature is a fulfillment of rules, that nature in its own way is constructive, beautiful, and fulfilling, that everything that is necessary is there. Every instinct in, man, in, the, in the animal world is towards survival, security, and the fulfillment of the laws of the kind, whatever they may be. The, man, the human being with his own book has all kinds of texts to study. He knows what attitudes make him sick. He knows how worry has given him a, struck, a stroke. He worry, who knows how poor nutrition has endangered his heart. He knows all the physical rules that he should live by. He knows that while he may not wish to be a diet victim, that he will have to be a student of physical nutrition if he wishes to have the maximum efficiency during the years of his life. If he does not do this, then he will have to face the difficulties of his own neglect of the rules of proper conduct. Then, of course, not quite so visible, is his inner life. 
But while it is true that he will accept that certain things that he eat will make him sick, he has never been willing to recognize and understand that certain feelings make him sick, that certain attitudes make him sick, and that he will continue to wreck the physical by using and misusing the powers of the metaphysical adversely. Also, then, he will also find that he can make a, have a sick mind. This doesn't necessarily mean that he has to be institutionalized as a mental patient. A person has a sick mind who is devoted to fear, grief, and unpleasantness, who is highly competitive, who is critical of those around him, all that type of thing. If he is always on edge, if his temper is uncontrollable, if he is a nuisance to other people, he will be a danger to himself. This is another one of the facts of life that we all have to learn. But because he has a mind that can make him sick, and he doesn't have the physical pain of physical illness, he pays no attention to the mind. He just considers that it's quite possible for him to be unpleasant if he feels like it. Well, other people are. Why shouldn't he be? So other people's mistakes become a, ju a justification for our own, and this itself is 100% erroneous. But actually, the individual has these other forms of illness which arise from the misuse of faculties. The brain, for example, is a rather handsome little fellow, if you can find him. He is uh, rather nice, too. And in fact, he can become a spoiled child in our keeping. He can be actually a, well, a habitual criminal as far as that's concerned. The mind can be all things. But the mind is also there. If we use it well, it supports the emotions and protects the body. If it, we use it badly, it destroys itself and destroys the emotions and body with it. The mind, therefore, being the first superintendent and supervisor of our personal lives, should be brought into proper order. It must be educated, not in abstract sciences, but educated in the problems of daily living. It must be a counselor that can always be uh, called upon in need. It must be the most perfect and useful of all psychoanalysts. It is also the, a great possibility in the field of psychotherapy. The mind must keep us healthy, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And if it isn't healthy and is unable to do it, then we are in trouble. And we go out and try to pay other people to do it for us. And as a result, we lose money. But we do not cure the trouble. So the mind is a part of our lives. It's part that requires discipline. It is something that we have to grow, improve. We have to get a mind that is fair, honest, gentle, lovable, kindly, all these things. And it must also be addicted to common sense. It must be able to look at things that happen and see why they happen and accept it. We use the mind now largely to create excuses for our own misbehaviors. We find it easier to try to rationalize our way out of a problem than to solve it. This is, again, not, not solutional. With a little work, we can find that we can live today in this world as it is with a full realization that we are here for a reason, that if we didn't deserve to be here, we wouldn't be here, and that we will continue to suffer various inconveniences and emergencies until we make the necessary corrections in ourselves. If in the course of time, therefore, it becomes evident that we are not going to be able to maintain a high standard of physical existence, that the time will come, and even the most optimistic person admits that the forests are going to give out, the water supply is short, that all these minerals in the earth are being depleted, and someday we'll have no more gasoline. All of these things cannot be solved by the blind hope that science will find a substitute. Things will improve only when the individual begins to conserve resources, where he doesn't waste them anymore, 
where he does everything possible to protect the well-being of all of his society, that he does nothing that will deprive others of their rightful parts in the facilities and problems of life. If he can get to this point of view, he will then find that his uh, energies and resources will extend considerably further than they do now. We have to learn to live together and work together. We have to learn to be patient with the mistakes of each other. And we must learn to step in and take care of a job if somebody else can't do it. These types of thoughts begin to develop a modern, a model person. Then we can certainly say that progress has meant something to us. Not because we sat on the top of it, but because we realized how poor it was and did something about it. Progress is not the advancement of the status in quo. It is not the individual continuing to do what he's doing now and hoping to get away with it. It is not a problem of constant and eternal waste and extravagance on the basis of an, of an absolute, bount, absolutely bountiful deity who will always take care of him. These things are fallacies. What is actually necessary is that the individual right here builds the golden age that he believes is good, that we build our new world of reformations right now. And that was the basis of the great utopian dreams of the past, that there would come a time when humanity, through common judgment, through just, just kindly and good-natured realization of facts, would build a world that it would be nice to live in, and not only nice to live in, but less dangerous, in which there would be no more war, and no more strife, and no more pillage, and no more religious intolerance, and no more backbiting and slights, petty crime and major crime, but that people would live together in a community of purposes, dedicated to trying to do a better job of living than they had ever done before, and resolved to continue to build a better world than they've ever known before. And instead of setting back and saying how proud they are of our progress, that they will sit back and rather shamefully uh, remark that it's too bad that uh, we've had our delinquencies so long. We can uh, make a little bit of progress in these ways. And nature is always helpful. Never forget that nature is there to help. It's creating a problem situation today that is monumental. We probably will never face, or have never in the face, past faced a world dilemma such as this we such as we are in now, uh, which seemingly is there seems to be almost no way out. But there is. Don't worry, there's a way out. But it is a very serious dilemma. And instead of saying, "Oh, this is awful," we have to say to ourselves, "Well." At least the divine power of things is mindful. And when we fail, the universal laws are going to step in and make sure that we succeed. And the, all of this misery is simply to remind us that for several thousand years of civilization, we've done it the wrong way. If we continue to do it the wrong way, we will continue to suffer. If, however, we learn the lesson, recognize the mistakes, and correct them, we can go on for a long time in a golden age we have created for ourselves. Uh, in the meantime, each person, quietly, personally, gently, simply, in his own life, should live the best he can, keep the rules as far as he can keep them, practice the virtues of his religion, for all teach the same, and realize that education begins after he leaves school, and that from the time he becomes a mature person, he is in the position to improve, gain, and enlarge understanding and realizations, and that he is every day of his life in the presence of an opportunity to grow, to outgrow something and to grow into something else, that every moment that he is here is an opportunity to meet the challenge for which he was intended. And out of this, gradually, he will observe something. If his temper is better, his blood pressure will be better. If his habits are more moderate, his health will be more vital. If his attitudes towards other people are more constructive, he will find a world of constructive attitudes headed in his direction. Whatever he corrects, does, 
is going to be an end of some kind of misfortune, sorrow, pain, or trouble. He is going to be able to gradually learn that uh, though there be many that fall upon the right hand and many upon the left hand, the just person cannot be moved. The just individual is not only thinking of the small span of his present life, but by establishing his integrities, goes forth into the unknown with a better hope. The more we are able to live well here, the greater reason we have to hope that we will be properly cared for after we depart. As long as we are willing to pass over into another life without any preparation in thoughtfulness and virtue, if as most orthodox people believe we are going to God without any of our mistakes corrected, waiting for the bounty of heaven to cure us, this I think is going to prove a disappointment. It should be a disappointment. In fact, it is the only disappointment. Now, if that happens by any chance, we are not going to be eternally punished. We are just going to be reminded that we've played hooky, that we very carefully avoided the lessons we were supposed to learn. And when a child insists on avoiding the lessons that are supposed to be learned or are necessary to him, there's one answer, send him back to school. And if the situation gets so that we get out of this world without doing something about it, we'll be back and we will be back to correct the same faults we face now. We were not going to have new faults unless we get a few new ones, and a very few that we haven't tried already. But we will find that if we don't do something now, we have no hope of getting any better. And I think that this is a, a more useful attitude than the, civil, than the materialistic attitude of science that we begin with a drop of life and end of uh, uh, an ash at the end of it all. That there is nothing beyond or before. Whereas the fact is there was much before and that's why we're here. And there's much beyond and that's why we'll probably be back. But whatever it is, the sooner we learn to think straight, the more pleasure and helpful and useful life will seem. And we will be able to achieve. The, best, the better we live now, the better our destiny forever. We never have to face the same problem twice because the moment it is solved, it is no problem. And if we keep on solving old problems and not making new ones, one of these days we're going to come out even with the laws that govern the universe. And we're going to discover that we live in the best world we will ever know, the most just creation that we can imagine under the most benevolent powers that can be conceived of by the most abstract theologian. All is, re all is re well as far as it goes, but at the moment it's not going far enough. Therefore, we have to do a little better. In the meantime, we hold good thoughts for each other and we preserve our dedication to the divine power that rules all things. And that will...